Hey, what's the largest problem you're facing right now with your junk removal business? Are you still researching the business and you're looking, hey, where do I get started? Are you not getting enough jobs? Are you slam busy and you're having to turn away work, but you don't know how to take it to the next level, how to hire crews and get more trucks? Are you worried that the crews you have aren't doing a great job or maybe even stealing from you? These are all problems that every junk removal business owner is gonna face as they grow. These are problems I've had and I've learned how to solve. The solutions can be found in the complete Junk Removal Business Training Series. Grow your business, change your life with the JRA Complete Training Series. Welcome everybody to Let's Talk Junk. It's 12 noon Eastern time on Tuesday. I'm Lee Godbold with Junk Removal Authority. Glad to be here and excited to bring you another great uh, live presentation. So uh, before we get started, if you guys are interested in getting in the junk removal business, make sure to check out our junk removal business package. It's a great franchise alternative. If you're researching franchises, we can generally offer the same great, if not better support for a fraction of the cost with no long-term commitments and no territory restrictions. Make sure to check it out. All right, so today's topic that we're gonna be going over is kind of an interesting one. It's a problem a lot of you guys would like to have and it's also a problem that many of you will have, and I put problem almost in quotation marks, it's a problem many of you will have come about June after we're in busy season. And it's what to do with excess money in your junk removal company. All right, so right now we're coming out of, we're coming out of uh, slow season. And during, uh, during slow season, you're, con you know, you get in January and February, and if you guys are new to the business, you're like, wow, it's super, super slow. Most of you guys are saying that. Now, there's some outlier in areas, some California. A lot of times, Florida is pretty good in the winter. Um, not so much this winter, but uh, many, many times, uh, California and Florida do pretty good through the winter. Texas does pretty well. You know, there's areas of the country and even pockets of uh, some of the northern climates that, especially when the weather turns nice, they'll do okay in the December, January, February months. But by and large, it's very slow. Many of you have gotten nervous and you're like, whoa, where, is this business gonna work? Is it ever gonna come back? Is my business going to survive? Or am I gonna run out of money and have to go get another job and do something else? Uh, something I went through first two years, three years of operation, those months were tough. That January and February was tough. Um, and the very first November we went through, November is normally a decent month. The very first November we went through, I think we did three jobs the entire month. So it was ridiculous. Um, I was really, really worried, and I'm sure you guys have kind of been in that position. On the other end, though, what's about to happen is March, as a general rule, now this is not the same for every business nor in every market, as a general rule, March through October is 2x, so two times the business that you're going to do in January and February. Now, this is pretty much for an established business. I meant to just underline 2X, January through February, but this is pretty much for an established business. And it's also, you're not changing anything up. You're not increasing your advertising spend uh, tremendously. You're not doing new advertising methods. Um, your SEO hasn't improved. You know, as a general rule on a stable junk removal company, take junk, you know, junk doctors, uh, we can't spend any more money, we're maxed out. Uh, our Google Ads budget is set so high, there's no way we're ever gonna be able to hit it. Um, the SEO, we're number one, number two on just about every single major keyword in all three markets that we're operating in. We're doing as much home advisor as we're gonna do. Uh, email campaigns, we'll continue picking up more property management companies and, and uh, realtors and all through the email campaigns and outreach that we do. But for the most part, Junk Doctors is pretty stable. This is our 10th year in business. Uh, we'll do probably a little, say our goal this year is like 3.2 million uh, in sales. I imagine we'll hit that. And uh, it's pretty stable. On a new business, you guys actually might even do better than that. So if you're a pretty new business and you're starting to increase that advertising spend. Just basically talk about all the stuff that I just said that Junk Doctors doesn't do. If you start doing that, that 2X might even be a 3X or better. And especially if you started in January and February, you just throw that completely out the window. You guys are so new anyway. 
uh, just know that it's about to pick up uh, significantly in March through uh, October. So why is all this important? Why is this topic important? Because I will tell you right now, I have wasted more money. I've lost more money when I had more when I had the most. When I, when I lose the most money is when I have the most is when I have the most money. So uh, early on in business, this was this was an issue that I'd have because what would occur is when you get a lot of money, you're like, wow, things are great. I'm making a ton of money. This business has turned the corner. And uh, you pretty quickly forget about that Janu the December and January and February, especially January and February, that's pretty lean. So I want people to make sure they're really paying attention in during the busy months on where you're actually spending your money. I, I think a lot of people think that it's most important to pay attention to expenses when you're making the least money, or at least that's when most people actually take a look at it. So when things are tough, when it's tight, you're looking at every single penny you're spending and you're trying to figure out where you can cut. You should do that year round and you're gonna have more money. If you do it year round, you have more money going into the slow season for next year uh, where you're not gonna get as stressed. You've got more resources to kind of really make it through and your business is gonna be much, much, much better. You're not gonna have to make these cuts. So before we talk about what I want, one of the things we're gonna talk about is what to spend excess money on because using your money and investing your money is important. It's not that you wanna hoard it all, but at the same time, what we wanna address now is what not to spend it on. So, one of the very first things you do not wanna spend it on, and this is going to be easy to do, this is one I've been guilty of, and you probably know exactly where I'm gonna go with it, is the first thing you do not wanna do is go out and get a brand new 2021 F-150 Limited new edition, which I just got, but you know what, I've been in business 10 years and, and I can do that now. But if you're brand new in business and this is your first or second year that, uh, you liked that Matt, didn't you? I saw you chuckling back there. Dude, this truck is sweet, guys. Have y'all seen this new 21 F-150? This damn thing has got, it's got vibrators, in, not vi that's, it does not have vibrators in your seat. It's got a massager. Uh, this, is, this show's going in a bad direction already. This thing has got a massager in your seat. I can lay back. It's lay flight seats. I can lay back in that seat, and the thing will give me a massage. So um, anyway, it's completely ridiculous. Probably never should have bought it. Spent way too much money on a truck, but you know what? I can do it. And if you follow these principles, that one day, you know, that if you can already, one day you'll also be able to do it as well. So the thing's not to spend the money on. is just a ridiculous uh, personal vehicle. So personal vehicles, trucks... You got to have a reliable vehicle to get around, but much beyond that, just that's all. This is all you need: personal vehicle. You, you don't need to get a personal vehicle. Um, the other thing, and this is a very common one, so many guys, so so many of you are so used to just uh, spending almost everything that your business brings in. Like there's this, and we talk about it some, but there's like this mentality that a lot of business owners have, which is I have to reinvest every penny I make back into my business in order to get more growth. Part of that's correct if you're spending it on the right things. But if you get to the point where you're spending as much money as possible on the right things and there's money left over, that money doesn't have to be spent. So what many of you do though, what many business owners do, and remember, all these things on here I've done myself, is you go into bad advertising, or it's not, bad may be a wrong word here. Um, it's less effective advertising. Because in my opinion, pretty much all advertising works if you spend enough money on it and you do it for a long enough period of time. The problem is, is you and me and, and just anybody gonna be watching this podcast, we're not Coca-Cola, uh, we're not IBM, we don't have ridiculous amounts of money to sit there and spend money on branding advertising or less effective advertising or you might even call a lot of the advertising we do direct response. Um, the official definition of direct response is not but pretty much is non-direct response advertising. What I hear all the time and what it is is everybody wants to grow faster. I'm right there with you. I want to grow faster too but throwing money at many different things isn't necessarily uh, going to make you grow faster. So what a lot of times happens is when people maximize their spend on Google Ads, they maximize 
their spend on HomeAdvisor, they're doing SEO just as much as they possibly can, and they have excess money left over because that stuff has been working, they want to spend it. It's like that money just can't, they can't just leave that money there, they can't pay themselves or anything like that, or they can't leave it in a reserve account. They just want to spend, spend, spend it. So what happens is you're going to go into TV. We wasted a bunch of money on TV. Bunch of money. I think We spent, uh, it was like five grand a month over a six month time frame. It was like 50 or $60,000 and I think it got us like seven or eight jobs or something. Something ridiculous. TV, radio. Um, got Junk does a lot of radio. Radio works for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. 1-800-GOT-JUNK also does $300 million a year in system-wide revenue, of which I think it's 2% goes uh, back automatically into a national advertising fund. So they have like a $60 million radio, uh, advertising budget. They have the money to consistently spend money on radio for a long enough period of time to build that brand. They also have some name recognition. You got to remember, just because it works for 1-800-GOT-JUNK, if it works for Coca-Cola, if it works for really large companies, car lots, whatever, doesn't mean it's going to work for your situation and your junk removal business. So less effective, non-direct response advertising. We've even, sometimes even, um, and we do a little of this, but print your money mailers or valve packs. This is, kind of, that's kind of like an iffy one. Um, the valve packs and money mailers can work. You normally get out back out about what you spend on them. But once you factor in expenses and everything to actually carry out that job, you wind up not making a whole lot of money. So you want to avoid the less effective non-direct response advertising. I got more that's coming too, but if we have any questions, guys, make sure that uh, you let me know and we'll get to them in just a moment. All right, the next item. Uh, constant website upgrades. Oh, this is a big one. Constant website upgrades. This is something I was constantly just screwing around, just messing with my website. You know what? Here's the deal, guys. Once you get a good website, your customer, if, you, if your website is set up for pop, proper conversion rate optimization, if it's converting at a little over 20%, 25%, sometimes 30, that's a little high and aggressive. But if it's got a good conversion rate, if you've got nice pictures on your website, if it's putting off the image you want to put off, changing it up all the time is stupid. It's stupid. The, most, the reason most business owners change their website is they've gotten bored of their website. It's like driving around, it's like me. I had a perfectly good you know, 2016 F F-150 pickup truck had heated seats, cooled seats, leather seats, but it didn't give me that massage and, and, and it, it, just, it wasn't brand new and it was gotten old to me. Somebody's going to buy that truck and that's going to be the truck of their dreams. It was to me. I went from driving a 1993 Chevy pickup truck <clears throat> to driving that 2016 F-150. That, uh, that was my dream truck at that point and it's going to be a dream truck for somebody else. Somebody else is going to love it. it. I just got bored with it, so I went off and got a new truck. And in your case, what many of you are doing is you're getting bored of your website. Well, here's the thing, guys. You're not buying your product. You're not going to make your business successful because you like your website. Well, but I want to be proud of what I put out. Your website's fine. 99.9% .9 of people that look at it are perfectly happy with it if you have a good website. So that's one of the things, there's critical things here is some of you guys, you got crappy websites. I, you, I, you know, it loads slow. It's got, you can't find the phone number. You got pictures that look terrible. It's pictures of garbage. Nobody wants to look at pictures of garbage. They want to show happy people removing the garbage. So if you don't, if you got a crummy website, can it. Put it in the trash can, get another one. If, you, if your website's good, quit screwing around with it. Go on to other things. You got better things to spend your time on. So you don't want to be spending money on constant website updates. All right, larger warehouse. Everybody, everybody, they just feel like, man, I've, uh, I've arrived. I'm more of a business owner. I'm more of a man if I have a large warehouse. In the case of warehouses, size does not matter. It just doesn't. Size does not matter. Having a warehouse does not matter. Self-storage facilities. You can run a million dollar year business out of a self-storage facility. So you guys want to get this large warehouse, 
listen, it ain't going to work out. At least not, it's not like you think it is. You will enjoy having it. And listen, one day, if you've got a junk removal business bringing in a couple million dollars a year and you're making a few hundred thousand dollars a year, hell, go out and get a warehouse. Just like I went out and got that truck and go out and get a warehouse and, and be happy with it. And listen, we're in a great, um, there is something to be said about having something that's nice. Uh, you know, we went from, uh, with JRA, 15 people being crammed into a 1,700 square foot office to a 6,000 square foot office that's super, super nice. We enjoy being here. We get more done because of it. There's some pride in it. Uh, you want to continue growing it. It's some validation for your efforts. And I recognize that that's the case. And once you've reached that pinnacle and that point, this is excellent to do. It is very cool. Very, very cool when you roll up in your building and your sign is on the door. No doubt about it. It does feel like you've arrived. But if you do this too soon, it's going to hamper your entire business. And what's going to happen is you're going to get in to December, January, and February and you guys are going to sound like a bunch of wusses. You're going to be moaning and complaining about how you don't have any money because you didn't take advantage of when you had plenty of money when you were busy. Man, my, I'm, I'm in a mood today, aren't I? I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm keeping it real today. I'm just pounding. All right, let's see. Um, larger, large maintenance on older equipment. So this is something I screwed up royally on many, many times. I'd sit there and uh, uh, large maintenance repairs. I would take a truck we had, this goes back to the whole fallacy I had when I founded the, we founded the business on used equipment. I sat there and thought, why would I buy a brand new vehicle? Why would I spend, at the time, it's probably sixty, fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 on a brand new vehicle when I could buy a used one for twenty grand? It just didn't make any sense. It was like, for, I, could have, I could have two and a half vehicles for every one vehicle this next guy's buying. The problem is, is those things start breaking down. And before you know it, you're putting in a $10,000 engine. If you have a gas truck, it's a, it's, it'll be six or seven grand. Actually, the diesel is more like 13 grand. It's about seven grand to replace a, replace a gas engine. You're putting a transmission on. And anytime the engine and transmission go out and it's because of age, that means everything else is going out also. So it's just gonna get really, really expensive. You need to plan ahead. Make sure you have new vehicles. You know, you get a you get a gas one of these gas Isuzu's gets about two hundred thousand miles on it. It's time to it's time to replace that baby. It's time to transfer the body over, get a new vehicle, make that a backup. It, you know, that thing is is it's going to be wearing out within the next year once it gets to about two hundred thousand miles. And we'll be getting to questions in just one moment. Unnecessary levels of management. Hey, by the way, I forgot to do my hat shout out. We got Mitch, Junk Masters, Minnesota right here, man. That's, uh, you guys, again, some of you guys have sent some hats. 950 Windy Rose, Sweet 204, Apex 27502. Put that in the description on there. We'd love to get some more hats and do some more shout outs here. All right, so the last thing is, uh, last step is unnecessary layers of management. Matt, how do you spell unnecessary? U-N-N what? How do you spell it? There we are. Unnecessary levels of management. This is probably so low on this board you guys can't even read it, but maybe, maybe you can. Uh, unnecessary levels of management. This is very easy to do, especially once you have an experienced crew, because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to see these guys grow with you, and you want to give them more responsibility. And sometimes you create responsibility but when there's actually not enough work that's there. And even if they're staying busy and doing things, it's stuff that could probably be done with an existing truck crew member. Most junk removal businesses can be run uh, with one supervisor managing pretty much the whole thing, and then you will need a dispatch, and that might be the same person. So the supervisor can, st if you're doing dispatch, the supervisor starts out, they can just help check the guys in in the morning and in the evening, make sure that the inventory has been purchased, make sure that um, the, the, if you're using a uh, whip around, the whip around's an app we love to use. Uh, on whip around, making sure that um, when maintenance is due, it's getting sent over to a fleet management company who's doing the maintenance on your vehicle. It's very, very basic stuff that a supervisor um, would need to do. And I've seen a lot of times, and I've been guilty of this in the past, you, you get people on salary, you pay them, uh, you get to the point you're just paying people for work that you think needs to get done but actually doesn't. Um, and, uh, and you'll get just wasting a, a bunch and bunch of money. 
So these are the six things that are most commonly wasted when things are good, when you have excess money. Money never sleeps, and uh, if you're not, and, and, and my take on that saying, money never sleeps, is an account with a growing amount of money is going to get spent, so you need to figure out a logical way to actually put that, uh, to, 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 to dedicate that money to, otherwise you're gonna find ways that are wasteful. What's our first question we got here, Matt? What is the highest peak month? It varies, and that is an excellent question. What we've generally seen is June, August, or October are going to be your busiest months in there. That being said, uh, March through, uh, especially mid-March, mid-March through the end of October are gangbusters busy. And if you guys haven't picked up yet, and you probably have, our contact center volume is way up um, all throughout the country. Junk doctors is way up. Our February wasn't great. Our January was 30% better than we did last year. Our February was maybe 10% better, so it wasn't a great February. But uh, once our weather turned, we've had an extremely wet winter. Once our weather turned, it picked back up. A lot of times around July, you'll see a little bit of a, um, a random downturn a week or two uh, in there. Normally, people take a lot of vacations in July right before schools go back in. So that there could be a little bit of a dip in July. What's our next question? Buy versus rent commercial space. That's depending on your situation. Um, if you have excess money, good credit history, if you've got an account that's built up, I love real estate, all about it. Um, you know, real estate is some point in the next few years where I'm gonna be you know, starting to stick a, a stick a bunch of the money that I've got and uh, I'm all for it. So I'm never gonna tell you not to buy something. But at the same time, if you're at the point where you need money to get more trucks, hire more people, spend more money on advertising, do that first before you go out and put a large down payment and have to make a bank payment on a, uh, on a property. Once all that's stabilized, you got a great business going and, and money's no longer a huge obstacle from your business growth, go buy if you uh, choose to. Real estate's awesome. Got anything else? All right, the last thing is a comment. Uh, after setting aside a rainy day reserve, we direct any surplus funds to where the best return can be found. The four options are increase advertising, expansion, paying down debt, or replacing old equipment. Well, what's unfortunate is I was exactly what I was about to go into, so I think I can just completely throw out the script that I was going to have on the next part of this episode, but you're 100% right. Um, who, uh, who was that, by the way? That was Roy Nickel. Yeah, that's an awesome comment, Roy. I appreciate your, um, your input there because you are 100% correct. The only thing that's missing, and I'm going to recover just a little bit, go a little bit more in depth on what Roy just uh, went, went over, cause, but he's 100% right. The only thing that I would say is missing out of that is paying yourself. Um, a lot of business owners, they, they're not on salary. They don't consistently pay themselves. So what happens is they wind up making a lot less money. And um, you need to be on salary just like anybody else. That way, um, there's a great book. I'm going to completely butcher this guy's last name. It's Mike, Mike McCallowitz or something like that. Wrote a book called Profit First. And what he talked about doing is uh, paying yourself as the owner first. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be um, paying yourself a lot. It's just get started small, get used to consistently paying yourself on a regular payroll schedule, and then grow it as you can. Make a commitment to increase it as you can. So what do you want to spend money on? You want to spend money on advertising. Now, just like Roy just uh, said, on advertising, uh, what we've generally found that you have to be doing, the two things you have to be doing uh, for the most part are Google Ads and SEO. And then I would also experiment with Facebook Ads, Home Advisor, uh, email campaigns. I think that's another one you should, you should be doing a lot of or your email campaigns. Um, and then if you guys have other avenues, I mean, if you want to throw out yard signs in there and all you can, but those are pretty inexpensive. If you put them out, you put them out, business will come off of them. But, you know, we don't track the success or failure of that very closely. Um, but you need to be doing all those. And then figure out what brings in the highest return. That's exactly what Roy just said. Whatever brings in your highest return, you want to maximize spending in that. That doesn't mean you stop spending 
completely on any of those other avenues. I like some diversity in there. So you want to keep spending some money on all those other things, but you're going to allocate more of your budget towards what is bringing you the lowest cost per job, assuming the, cu all cust the customer is equal. So you look at the average income per job for the advertising method you're looking at, and then you look at the acquisition cost for that advertising method, and you figure out the profit that you're earning off of that. And then that factors in, and then, and then you dedicate the majority of the money, the majority of your budget towards what is working. You maximize that spending, and then you go to the second thing, the third thing, the fourth thing. And you evaluate these numbers on a monthly basis to determine where your money's going. And you constantly, 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 this is what's so important on advertising, how can I spend more? I want more. How can I spend more, baby? All right, so this is a question you want to ask all the time. All the time. When I was, when I was running Junk Doctors, Christian runs it now. This was something we were always doing. When I was talking with, later on it was Shane. Before that, it was another advertising agency. And before that, it was me. Uh, it was, man, I want to spend more money. How can I spend more money on some advertising? And that's something I was asking all, all the time. And um, because I knew it worked. I knew the more I spent, the more I made. And that's the, that's the deal there is always be asking, how can I spend more? A lot, of, a lot of people, it's how can I spend less? They want to spend less money. They want to spend less. And what that is, is that's a carryover from your personal finances. It's a carryover from what you do personally. Because what you do personally, the expenses you have personally, they aren't making you more money. If you go out and you go to Outback, I love some Outback, but if you go to Outback and you spend $50 on a meal, which still isn't crazy. I don't know why I'm saying Outback. What's in, uh, Sol uh, not Sullivan's is local here. Uh, Fleming's, Fleming's. Fleming's is a national one you guys will be familiar Ruth with. Chris. Ruth Chris. Go off to Ruth Chris. Let's, not, let's, let's do some a little bit larger money. Ruth Chris, and it's going to be $200 a person. Uh, or I can go, let's, let's use Outback on the other end, or I can go to Outback for $50 a person. Guys, you're, you're going to be full after either one of them. The steak at Outback is almost as good as the one at Ruth Chris, and sometimes actually better. Uh, and you're going to, but you're going to spend a lot less money. So that extra amount didn't earn you anymore. But on advertising, if you go from $50 to $200 and it's working, you make more money. So if you ask, how can I spend more money? How can I invest more money on your advertising within your business? You can throw your damn budget out the window on your personal finances because you ain't going to need one. <laughs> Write that down. All right, so advertising. That is, that is one. I know we've got another question here, and y'all keep on throwing the questions my way. I'm in a mood just to roll through some questions today. All right, uh, as much advertising as possible. I don't think I missed anything there. So we're going to come on down here to uh, trucks. <laughs> when I was a kid, I always wanted big trucks. I wanted big trucks. Actually, I want to be a fighter pilot. I want a fighter jet. and probably won't ever do that, but um, I, want to, I, want to, I want to trucks. So I grew up, I became a junk removal company, and I had plenty of trucks. I got into shredding business. Guys, let me do a little backstory. I got into a paper shredding business. Um, this makes me sad. I, I, but simply because I thought the truck was cool. So I saw these shredding trucks. I'm like, man, that's pretty neat. So I looked online. I found this truck. I went out and bought the truck. Um, There's a guy. Well, a guy had come to me also before, a guy I knew, and he said, uh, he said, hey, I think the shredding business, he hired a shredding business for his uh, mother-in-law. I think the shredding business is something you ought to go into. It's just going to pair well with junk removal. So I started, yeah, that's a good idea. I looked in the trucks, and man, these trucks are cool. So I went out, bought a truck, started a business. As you can probably imagine, it, it did okay, but not great. Sold it, and kept with junk removal. But trucks, um, what happens though is, is, is people love trucks. People like them. They're proud of them, and you should be. But you don't get enough of them. And a lot of the reasons you don't get enough of them is because you're not doing enough advertising. But actually, the main thing is, is a lot of you guys are really busy. A lot of you guys are slam busy but you're afraid to spend more money on a truck now because what's going to happen is you're going to temporarily make less money before you make more. So when you get this truck here, this new truck, you've already got a good truck now that's working. You're going to have to hire crews. You're going to have to make sure you have workers' compensation insurance. You will make less money before you make more, but otherwise your business is going to die. Uh, in the airline world, uh, if anybody's pilots here, I know we've got a few pilots that uh, are starting junk removal businesses and maybe some that are watching. Um, a first officer, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, a captain. A captain on a regional airline, so um, uh, PSA uh, is an example of that. American Eagle is an example of that. 
A captain on a regional airline is going to make more money than a first officer on a main line. So your Americans, your Deltas, and all like that. So what actually happens is many people never take that step from captain on a regional to first officer on a, ma on a main line because there's going to be a two or three year time frame where on the main line you're going to make significantly less money than on the other end. But you know what? After a few of those years, you're making a lot more. And in the case of the airline world, you're going to retire making $225,000 a year for the last handful of years, two fifty. dollars Some of the other are making three hundred. dollars I don't think they're doing that now. But in your junk removal business, it's the same thing. You can get out and you make seventy dollars a year as a single truck operator on your truck if you're not reporting taxes, if you're not paying insurance, you're going to wear yourself out, your business is eventually going to close because you're going to die. We're all going to die at some point, but hopefully, sooner, hopefully later rather than sooner. You're going to, you might die. Of course, then you probably don't care anyway. Uh, but unless the business killed you, then you probably care. Or uh, you get sick. Listen, guys, you get sick. You need a little money. And what's the problem? Your business ain't paying you anything because you don't have a business. You got a job that you own, and you're not protected with any of the benefits that employers normally have. It's pretty crummy there. So uh, you could die, you could get sick, you could get hurt, or you could just get freaking fed up with it. It's hard work. Listen, it's enjoyable work from time to time. But at some point, you're going to be like, damn it, if I pick up one more freaking couch, I'm going to explode. And that's, that's when you're going to be like, dude, that God Bowl character knew what the hell he was talking about. Why didn't I listen to him? But you're going to be so freaking pissed. You're going to be so just done with it and burnt out. You're going to something else. Your business is going to fail because you didn't have the guts to do what you're supposed to be doing. Son of a bitch. Call me, call me, call me preacher. All right. What we got next? What kind of questions we got? All right. Uh, George Locko says, do you think starting out four months into the, into the business is worth buying a used truck to pull my roll off dumpsters? Man, go new if you can. Always, always, always. I'm going to say it again and again. New is where it's at. Downtime kills you in this business. And listen, you're not going to be successful in almost anything you do if you don't make a commitment. And going out and taking out a loan on a truck, that's making a commitment. It will scare the ever-living hell out of you. The first time you look and you're like, Jesus Christ, I have a $1,000 a month truck payment, you're going to just, it's going to scare you. Uh, and it should. But that, that, that fear, that fear of failure, fear of embarrassing yourself, fear of financial ruin or whatever, fear of that truck getting foreclosed, that is going to drive you to take the necessary steps to make your business work. Sometimes you need a push. Sometimes you need a pull, and in the case of that truck payment, that truck payment is going to be pushing you and pulling you. So it's a great, great, great motivator. Sometimes you got to get that just that little fear, little fear, good thing, good thing. All right, what do we got next? Uh, Thomas Baldwin says, "Amen, amen, brother." All right, all right, all right. Here we go. Next, have we got any more questions? Yeah, we got one. Oh, let's do it. All right. So uh, Roy is actually from Junk Relief in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Got it, Canada. He says, uh, how can we measure the advertising return? Yeah, you can just look. All right. I mean, there's four, formulas online. Uh, you can just look up how to track the ROI on, any, on anything. But uh, I think what you're talking about, you probably know that. What you're talking about is we use uh, Workies. Uh, and they've got some deal, some incentive they're doing. We are a partner with Workies, but they've, they've, uh, they're trying to help us or they're wanting us to push it a little bit harder. And it's an excellent, excellent, excellent CRM. I'm not going to recommend anything that I don't believe in. We've been using it for years. We used it years before we were partner. Workies.com slash JRA. There's some sort of discount they're running right now. I guess if I was, uh, if I was doing what I was supposed to, I'd know what it is. But Workies.com slash JRA, they've got it's some sort of a significant discount. If you sign up with that, when they purchase, you can uh, ask them how they heard about you. That's one method. It's not always 100% accurate, though, because you're relying on the customer to give a good, uh, accurate answer. The other answer is call rail. So, uh, hey, put, put that in the description too there, Mad Matt Mary. Get a little call rail action in there. So, call rail is pretty cool. What call rail does is if a customer comes from Facebook, from Google, from Home Advisor, from Google Organic, or they come to your site direct, or whatever, it changes the phone number. It dynamically changes the phone num um, number that appears on your website. And uh, it tells you because when they call that number, it says this came from whatever avenue. It also can record calls. You can listen back to them. You can mark them if they booked or not. 
and you can also associate a value. So you go to work, there's a little bit of manual legwork that has to get done here, which is unfortunate. Um, we do it automatically through our ads management service. Uh, at least part of it, not everything here. And we are working on a way, we're working with WorkEase as, uh, API as well as CallRail to build out a system that's going to automatically do this, but it's not finished yet. But what, what, what you do is you can input in the value of the job that was received for the, from the call that you got, and then uh, CallRail has graphs. They automatically compute what you spent. You can also, uh, in case of Google Ads, you can hook up your Google Ads platform to it. So. Uh, you'll know what you spent, you'll know how much income you got because you inputted in the, the job amount, you'll know how many jobs you got, you'll know your acquisition cost. So CallRail is one of the best places if utilized correctly and consistently to get that information that you're going after. WorkEase is the other one. Between the two of them, we found it to be very, very helpful. You really need WorkEase to be able to understand exactly what kind of uh, income you're getting off of each job. WorkEase has excellent reports, tons of reports. Uh, so we use that to track those, the advertising results. Got anything else? George says, uh, what is your take on roll-off dumpsters, dumpsters starting out in the business? Well, if you want to go into, if you want to rent roll-off, I love the dumpster business. I love dumpsters. I love junk removal. What I don't love is people that try and do both at the very start. So if you're trying to rent out dumpsters and you're trying to do junk removal, what happens is, you're, you're, you're spreading your resources out. So you're only going to have probably, and, and George, you might be in a situation that you got plenty of money and, this, and, and you're a sophisticated business person, you've been in business before, but if you're new to business and if you don't have unlimited funds, trying to do both is going to be tough because you've got to have a double the advertising budget. Uh, you're, you're, you got guys, you got, you have to have a CDL, well, it's probably you, but you're going to be dropping bins off. But the problem is when you're dropping bins off and you're renting them, uh, that's done on a different schedule, normally with one person, compared to your junk removal jobs, which might, might be later. And what's going to occur is uh, you're going to have junk removal jobs that go off late. You're, not, you're going to miss out on same and next day appointments because you have dumpster bins that you're dropping off. Focus on one or the other. The junk removal business as a whole is less startup cost, better profit margins. Dumpsters is amazing, an amazing business once you have the money from junk to go into dumpsters because dumpsters uh, you can build up and uh, it's great consistent monthly recurring income and you might turn around and decide to sell it to a big garbage outfit who's going to pay you a high multiple uh, just to get get you out of their you know out of their hair so both are great businesses if you're talking about using a roll-off trunk truck for junk removal i think it's just it's too expensive too much of a truck too uh, maintenance is going to be too high just just to offer junk removal services chris m says when do you suggest someone make the leap from part-time to full-time well, that's an excellent question, and it obviously is going to vary on how much you make. Uh, you know, if you're making thirty thousand dollars a year almost immediately, because you're going to be able to you're going to be able to make that up pretty fast. If you're making one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year, it it might be eighteen months or so in. But I actually like here's here's what you, the go, some of you guys that are making really good money. Maybe it's not one thirty. Maybe it's seventy. Uh, 60, 70, you know, 60, you get to the point you're 60, 70, somewhere in that range. In most areas of the country, that's a, it's a decent income. And you got to think long and hard before you give that up on a junk removal business that realistically probably won't be earning you that amount of money for 16 to 18 months. But the nice thing is, is you guys have a little bit of an advantage is because right from the start, you can keep your full-time job. If it's flexible enough, you can keep your full-time job. And you can, uh, especially if you have some vacation build up right here at the start. You hire a crew, you train a crew, maybe you start out some part time, afternoons, weekends, just kind of keeping them busy. And then once they're trained up, you let them actually go out and do the jobs while you work. And um, listen, there's going to be some challenges here. Uh, from time to time, they, they might not be able to get up with you because you're, you're busy doing something else. And, and that's going to, you know, you might miss out on some money there. But it's a way of getting started without having to get up that, give up that 80 grand a year job. What could happen, and let's say if you're at 80 grand, is by the time, I, and in my mind, once I got to 50, I'd, I'd be like, all right, you know what, at this point, I can go full time um, into what I'm doing because I feel like me working full time on this business is going to make up that 30 grand within a handful of months. So it's a different situation for everybody. Don't prolong it too long, but also don't let your full time job keep you from starting a junk removal business. It's a simple enough system, it can be done simultaneously. 
there will be some confusion sometimes. There will be some stress sometimes. Um, our contact center helps out a lot. And guys, we don't make a ton of money on the contact center. So when I mention the contact center, know that it comes from the fact that it was something I knew that was needed um, back when I ran junk doctors because I was constantly having to answer the phone, dinner, uh, lunch, you know, all hours of the day, weekends, and it was tough. So, I mean, the contact center was something that we created before just because we knew it was going to be needed. I thought we could make more money on it than we do. Uh, so, you know, when I mention it, it's from a convenience aspect, but um, if you're missing calls and all, you're just missing out on money, you're wasting your advertising dollars and everything. So anyway, use resources that are available, go ahead and get started before you quit and as a general rule. What you got? How much are trucks for a typical junk removal? Ones we sell, like on junkremovaltrucksforsale.com, um, you know, used to be about 60 or so. Uh, then we ran out of the Fuso FE-160s, we're having to sell the 180s now. So that adds about four grand, so you're about 64, 65 grand on it. Um, then uh, a Suzu, it'll stay about the same uh, as well. A Suzu's chassis, we've got 15 of them reserved for June. Uh, so we'll be switching from, from Fuso over to a Suzu come June. There's just no chassis available now. Anyway, the answer to your question is somewhere in the 60s. Anything else? Uh, two more. So how many employees do you send out to get jobs done for junk removal? Two per truck. So uh, two per truck, if it's a big job, maybe a little more. If you're training somebody, you might have three. As a general rule, it's two. Uh, Rich and Nick say pay-as-you-go workman's comp versus traditional. 100%, no doubt. Traditional workers' comp, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, you used to have to estimate your payroll. And um, what invariably what happens is as you grow, your payroll goes up and you forget about it. So you could be like us and all of a sudden, we actually had a year where we didn't get audited. There was something weird going on. Well, I'm jumping around here. So what happens is you estimate your payroll. At the end of that period, you get an insurance audit. They look at what you actually spent on payroll and then they, you owe the difference if you spent more. They might reimburse you. But in the case of a junk removal company, especially a new one, you should always be growing. Junk removal companies grow pretty fast. Even with increased competition coming in, we haven't seen a slowdown at all on growth rates for junk removal businesses. So uh, you would wind up owing a lot of money at the end. Pay as you go, they'll be your payroll service. They'll actually, um, uh, they'll, they'll, you'll pay the, um, uh, the exact amount that you owe each and every single pay period. The other thing you can look into, and I'll write it up here, and I'm trying to remember a name of one. I think it's, it's Alta Vista or something like that. Um, you can look into employee leasing companies. And this isn't, I think they're called employee leasing. We, we, I'm familiar with them, and I've heard good stuff out of some people that are using them. Um, it's not like temp labor, so don't confuse it with temp labor. What, the way employee leasing actually works is they technically work for a larger company, and this company might actually have health benefits. This larger company might have health benefits. They'll have thousands of people that work for them. Oftentimes, there's an, they have their own HR team, their own legal team. So what happens here is you pay a certain amount for each employee from them. And they do everything, everything that you want them to do, uh, they do. It's like a regular employee, but their paychecks actually come from this larger employee leasing company. They don't come directly from you. Workers' comp, they handle the workers' comp. They handle any HR claims. So uh, it's normally pretty cost effective too. We just, uh, we, we've just we researched it and we might move over to one uh, for junk doctors. Uh, the other thing, it's, there's some advantages for employees. Employees can actually go, if they get, want to get a loan on a vehicle or a house, Oftentimes it might look a little better. Uh, this is one of their selling points anyway. I'm not sure if it's any validity to it or not, but it can look better if it's this really large company that they actually work for. All right, so we're going back. Back on, uh, that was an awesome questions, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate the questions. Appreciate y'all watching. Just excited to have you here on Tuesdays at 12 for Let's Talk Junk. We have a lot of fun. Sometimes I, uh, sometimes I preach which I'm doing today, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. So I'm glad, I'm glad we got an audience. Otherwise I'd look insane if I, because I'd be doing this anyway. I'd just be talking. All right, so we talked about trucks. The, the one thing, that, why are trucks important? Well, obviously you just got to get as many jobs done as possible. So um, you don't want to miss out on same or next day. So same slash next day is so important in this business. You're going to close. If you book your job, if you book the job, somebody calls in, um, 
if somebody calls in and wants to book a junk removal appointment, if you're able to book them within 48 hours, you're going to close that job 95% of the time. So that means they're not going to call back and cancel. Industry average. After 48 hours, you're going to come, it's, they're going to cancel at almost a 50% rate. It's absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. And a lot of them aren't even going to book. So a lot of them aren't even going to, going to schedule just because they know they want it done that fast. So you got to get the same or next day. Um, also, you want some backups, uh, you know, meaning you know, the more trucks you have, it, it's more efficient. So yes, you do go through the deal, you know, especially when you go from one to two trucks. That's when uh, you, you, you lose the most money or you go from making decent money on one truck to losing a lot on the second. Um, but you're so much more efficient because now you can break your, your zones into a north-south zone or an east-west zone. You're not late to jobs as often. Your guys are in better moods because they're, they're, having to work, they're able to work more predictable hours. Um, you're not spending as much on fuel. Your disposal fees might, fees might be a little bit better. It's just a ton of advantages from one to two trucks. And then once you get to three or four, that's when, that, that's, that's when the business is beautiful. It is an absolutely beautiful thing to see a four truck junk removal operation. All right, the last thing, and this is the one that's fun. I like this one. This is the one I like. Paying your self. Paying yourself. I got a smile on my face. You know why? Because for a long period of time, I see too many business owners that are out there they're busting their ass, they're working hard, they're taking risk, and they've got, they feel like they're gonna upset the entrepreneurial gods if they take a dollar out of their business. It's crazy, it is absolutely insane. Pay yourself, you didn't start hauling junk because you enjoy doing it. Maybe you enjoy doing it, but I tell you what, if you enjoy hauling junk and you don't care about getting paid, 950 Windy Road, Suite 204, Apex, North Carolina. You can get on one of our junk doctor's trucks. We'll give you as much junk hauling experience as you want to get for a long period of time. All right, so paying yourself. Pay yourself. Pay yourself. Let's do it. Pay yourself. So start with a small amount here. You don't have to do a lot. When you first get going, from the very first day you operate, you should not go without paying yourself. At least pay yourself the going hourly rate for on-the-truck work. And if you do that, you're starting to get in that habit. And then listen, make it a salary. Don't do it just hourly. You know, make it a salary. Say, you know what, I'm going to pay myself 200 bucks a week. $200 a week. It's nothing. Start out with 200 a week. And then once you start, uh, say three months later, you know what, I'm going to take this 200, I'm going to double it. I'm going to go to 400. Three months later, I'm going to go four to eight. Three months later, you might not double it at that point. You might go from eight to 12. And before you know it, you've got a livable income of three, four, five thousand dollars a month. So, if you are at this point where you have excess money, and if you're at this point where you, uh, you've got some extra money saved away, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Saving some money away for the slow season. If you've done that, raise your pay, guys. Hell, take a dividend if you want. If you guys have been working or distribution, if you guys have been working for a year or two on this thing and you haven't been paying yourself and I know plenty of you, plenty of you guys personally that have talked to me and I can't get you to pay yourself. Pay yourself. That's the third thing. What kind of question we got, man? Chris Jewett says, if you're doing this part-time or weekends, how do you handle calls throughout the week? Chris, I appreciate you watching today, man. Thank you for uh, joining us, and also appreciate your questions. All these questions and comments are awesome, amazing. They make me feel like what I talk about, people actually care about. So, it, uh, you know, it's like that massage in that truck. It's just, it's just nice. So, um, but the answer to your question is, um, again, you know, we've got that, that JRA contact center. It, you only pay for the jobs that are scheduled. Um, we, we've got your schedule. We know your pricing. We know your service area. We answer the phone using your business name. Um, that's why that was created. And it is done, it can be done also as a backup. So let's just say if you're available and on the weekends, if you want to be the one to take your calls, you don't want to spend the money on the contact center or whatever, whatever reason, you can do it. And then if you miss calls and all, it can just, it can come over to our contact center. 
So that contact center exists. Uh, one of the reasons it exists is because, I, I mean, it was the first service we devised, and the reason we kept it, we realized we don't make as much money as we want to make on it or would have liked to have made on it, is because on the marketing end of things, how many calls we were seeing were missed or being missed. And then what would occur is we would get blamed for the marketing not working because the phone calls were being missed or they weren't being handled properly. So that's the reason the contact center exists. With it out there, then you can do exactly what you're trying to do. Thank you, Chris, by the way. I appreciate you watching. Two comments. One is the junk cartel says, keep on preaching. I and got Roy, it, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for your support. And Roy says, talk to your accountant to decide the best way to pay yourself. 100%. And guys, listen, I, if we got some readers out there, or even if you don't have some readers, you have Audible now, audiobooks. Uh, it's Profit First. Can we get that in the description? It's Profit First. I'm going to say the guy's name wrong. I said it earlier. It's Mike... McCallowitz. Now what Mike actually, I might even do an episode, a little bit of an episode on this, but what Mike actually wants you to do is actually have multiple bank accounts and actually send percentages of your money to those different accounts. Uh, admittedly, we don't do that, but the same principles he talks about, we basically do. We just have fewer accounts. Um, thank you, Roy. I appreciate your, uh, your, your backup there and everything. Uh, was that last one? Hey, listen, everybody. Y'all do a little comment. Give a little shout out. And tell Mad Matt Mary back there. Just, just working. He's doing the magic of these cameras. I'm not good with cameras, man. You know, y'all. Did y'all ever see any of these early videos I put out? They were terrible. Y'all look up some of these old videos I had. I'd be, I'd be answering my daggone phone in the middle of it, and I was such a bad editor that I wouldn't cut it out. So you like, you literally were like, you might even have, you hear, you might hear me on the telephone or something like that. It was pretty weird. So they were terrible videos, horrible audio. It was in like this cold, I've got this shed in my backyard and uh, uh, it's, it was cold, man. I was doing some of that stuff. It was like, you can see my breath. It was like 30 degrees out there in that thing. And I was, uh, I was recording. Anyway, uh, Mad Matt Mary, y'all give him a shout out. He's keeping this stuff going. He's the, one of the reasons, actually the reason we had the live show because otherwise it'd be me in front of him. It'd be me holding my, my phone up right here. I know y'all look at, you know, but you know, get that double chin if you go too low. But, um, Mad Matt Mary, appreciate you back there. Appreciate everybody watching today. Uh, tell me that question one more time. Um, there, I don't think there was a question. Well, there wasn't a question. Well, let's just keep moving on. Mike McCallowitz, profit first. All right, expense creep. This is something that is very common when you get busy. And the most common things that will creep, the very most common is payroll, um, tools missing, your fuel might even creep up, potentially you just might have better ways, more efficient routing of your trucks you could potentially do, maybe you could combine more jobs. Uh, disposal fees, this is really common if you have a high minimum load. If you have a high minimum load, uh, and your guys are, your dispatch isn't doing a great job on, on, on determining when you can combine loads and you're hitting this minimum a lot, it's going to jack up your disposal fees. Uh, let me see, did I miss anything else here? I got tools and supplies, fuel, disposal fees, payroll. So, I mean, there's other things that can really inch up. Um, the other thing just to watch out on is like insurance cost. Shop on insurance. Um, it, this doesn't necessarily creep up. It's just if you're not paying attention to it, if you don't have a good insurance broker, by the way, on insurance, um, you can use an uh, independent agent. Also, if you guys are interested in insurance, I've, I might have a contact for a few of you guys, so feel free. What's an email address they can use? Uh, yeah, just do, it's very long. I apologize for that. Lee Godbold at JunkRemovalAuthority.com. If you guys are looking for uh, some insurance stuff. I think I've got a guy we've been pretty happy with that we can refer you over to, uh, depending on what area you're in. But expense creep, it gets to be very, very common because again, you're not really paying attention to your expenses very closely when you're busy. And it's just, you're not. You're like, I'm making enough money. Most of you guys, a lot of times during busy season, you guys are making more money than you've ever made in your whole life. So you're like, you know, you don't think about the money you're leaving on the table because it seems like you've got so much now. But the problem is, is you're not accounting for the fact that that December, January, and February is, uh, is certainly coming. So expense creep, every month you need to be watching, at least once a month, you need to be watching your expenses. So how do you do that? What do you need to do 
to protect yourself from expense creep. You should have a bookkeeper that is uh, keeping your books on a monthly basis. They're reconciling your bank accounts and they're matching your bank accounts up to what's in your accounting software, which is QuickBooks. And listen, you need QuickBooks. There's a, um, one of the other YouTube channels out there. I, I was, somebody sent me something and asked me my opinion on a video that he had put out and it was around uh, not needing QuickBooks. It was around just using your bank account for your bookkeeping. Guys, QuickBooks is like 40 bucks a month. Use QuickBooks. It's gonna, it's gonna really, really help your business out. It's gonna help you evaluate exactly how you're doing. Um, so you, you're, you've got your accounting stuff and then every single month you need to be reviewing your profit and loss statement so your P and L and your cash flow statement. Every single month you're looking at this. And what you're looking at also in your P and Ls is you want to compare this month's P and L to the prior month's P and L, this quarter's P and L to the prior quarter's P and L. And you want to look for trends. So are you noticing a trend? Right now your fuel percentage is probably going up. So we went, we were 4% last year on fuel cost. Uh, which is pretty low actually. I mean, we used to see 6%. So we were 4%. We're up to close to 5% now as this fuel prices keep going up. Hopefully with um, most of the refineries and everything back online after those winter storms, it'll start sneaking back down again. But we, we have noticed it creeping up. Um, them discontinuing the pipeline is obviously going to hurt uh, fuel prices. So uh, you're going to have to adjust prices accordingly. And if you're not watching your P&L, you might not really realize that, at least to the extent to be able to raise prices up. So you're looking at all this stuff, you're comparing everything from month to month, you're looking at the percentage of income and you're trying to determine, is any of these expenses just sneaking up on me? And if, then if they are, you figure out why and you fix it. So that's how you avoid expense creep, is you be a business owner. And uh, sometimes when you're a business owner, it's hard being a business owner. And what I mean by that is you get so involved on the day-to-day, -day, carrying out the task, putting out fires, getting the work done, that you actually don't take the time to do this. And you might find that you could pay somebody to do ha half the stuff that you do, and probably the other half doesn't even get done, and then, uh, and then you'd, be, uh, you'd have time for this stuff, and you could actually make more money off of doing this right than what you pay somebody else to do it. So that's how you avoid expense creep, one of the ways you avoid expense creep. The other thing, other thing you gotta do is you watch your average job income. Average job income, I preach it all the time, Average job income and customer acquisition cost are pretty much the two most important metrics, numbers for your junk removal business. If your average job income is greater, excuse me, if your average job income, if the amount between, uh, the average job income is going to directly affect how much you can spend to get a customer. So the higher this goes, the more advertising you can do because the more advertising becomes profitable. What can happen is some of your techs, if, they start, if you start seeing that average job income coming down, it's not necessarily, sometimes just load sizes go down. We saw that a little bit with COVID. The, the number of jobs was good, but the load size went down. They kind of recovered. But um, uh, that's one thing you'll notice. If you have any techs that are any, uh, any team members that have a consistently lower average job income, you need to investigate why. In the job pictures to determine, you know, maybe are they just missing these pictures or are they just missing these, uh, these quotes, just under quoting because they're not confident in the pricing or are they stealing? So that's an important one to follow is that average job income. How much money you should have going into December? This is not an exact science and it's never a perfect scenario. But for the most part, if you take your fixed cost, cost on operating a business, on operating your business, and I'm going to actually, some of the fixed costs I'm going to list up here aren't necessarily the official definition of a fixed cost. Because um, like payroll can vary, and you'll vary it some, but ideally you've got 1.5 months of payroll, truck payments, any type of rent that you have. Uh, I, I group advertising in here because you guys are gonna, your business is really gonna suck if you're not, if you stop spending advertising dollars in the slower months. 
uh, advertising, uh, insurance. Looks like the last one, insurance. And the important thing here is I talk about paying yourself. It's important also to be able to pay yourself with payroll as well, all throughout that winter. You shouldn't starve either. So now listen, 1.5 months, a lot of you guys, it's gonna, it might be three years before you're gonna be able to accomplish that. So the answer to your question is, is at least get like three weeks. Find a way to get at least three weeks and um, your business isn't gonna completely die throughout those months, but that should be a, a at least a, a close enough of a cushion to help you through. A month would be excellent, and then once you get to 1.5 months, you're gonna feel pretty good about what you got going on. And uh, once you have this saved up, that's when you can start increasing the amount that you actually pay yourself. So we're gonna start wrapping this thing up now. If we've got any other questions, uh, please post them. Here's something that I want you, a couple things I wanna leave you with just to think about. If you do this stuff right for several years, then you're not going, you, you're, you never, you're always gonna watch, wanna watch for expense creep and all, but you're gonna be able to go out and buy those personal vehicles that you want, the recreational vehicles that you want larger house, you're going to have more free time. Uh, you're, when you go through the winter and everything, you're not really going to have the stress. I don't get stressed about slow season. I know busy season's coming. It just doesn't bother me anymore, but we have the resources not to be stressed. I've been exactly where a lot of you guys are though, where you're like, uh, you're just worried that, you know, am I going to be able to make rent payment, house payment? You know, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, that, that happened those first couple of years. Luckily, I didn't really have much expense, but I mean, I was, you know, there's some worry there. I was mainly worried about, was this business actually not going to work out because I had so much invested in it. I just wanted to see it be successful. A lot of pride in it too. So I know exactly where you're coming from. If you guys follow these principles, if, if you pay attention to money, not only when you don't have it, but also when you have it as to where it's going, you're going to be much more successful. Oftentimes people say, I don't remember the exact saying, but it's like leaders are made or leaders, the, the, care, the ability of a leader or a manager can be measured by how they handle a crisis. I would actually argue that the good managers and the good leaders are probably going to go through a lot fewer crises, and they're probably actually the better managers. If you can avoid a war, if you can, if you can accomplish what you want by avoiding a war, you're not... Uh, you're, you know, then, then you're, you're better off anyway than going through an actual crisis. Any questions before we, uh, before we end here? All right, guys. Again, 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 really appreciate you joining us. 12 noon Eastern time. We talk junk on Let's Talk Junk with Junk Removal Authority. Remember, watch those, those monies, 12, that, that money, 12 months out of the year. Keep an eye on it. Watch out everything we said. That's going to set you up. Right now, the reason I'm doing this in March is I want you prepared for next winter. Next winter, I want you ready for it. That way, you can tackle next winter in the best way possible. I'm Lee Godbold, Junk Removal Authority, where we help junk removal business owners make more money and live a better life. We'll see you next week. Hey, Junk Removal business owners, I want to show you something right now. I want you to check out just one of the over 150 courses as part of our Junk Removal training series. There have been many new Junk Removal people who have said they would remove a basketball goal at a customer's home for far too little money. If a basketball goal has a pole that goes into the ground, there will be concrete. One of the issues is you don't know how much. Sometimes the person who put in the goal was a bit overzealous on how much concrete they used. So you're going to dig into this, you're going to get the pole, and there might be like 500 pounds of concrete on the bottom. It's just very, very heavy. There are two methods of doing this job, and which way you go is dependent on the customer. The easiest and most cost-effective removal method is to simply take your sawzall and cut the pole off as close to the ground as possible. When you make your first cut, make sure to do so a few feet off the ground. The reason for this is the bottom of the pole is going to be filled with concrete and you're going to ruin a reciprocating blade if you hit it. Once the first cut has been made, you can look down the pole to see how close you can get to the ground. Once you cut it off as close to the ground as possible, load the truck and the job's finished.
Removing a goal using this method will generally be done on a volume-based rate as you would normally charge. Many customers are not going to like this. They're going to want the pole and the concrete gong. Again, safety is the name of the game here. The best way to remove a basketball goal is to use a skid steer. If you do not own a skid steer, you can actually go and rent one for the job. The time and the energy that you're going to save by using a skid steer and the level of professionalism you're going to show is going to be well worth it. The first thing to do is to use your sawzall and make a cut most of the way through the pole. Then maintain control of the top half while bending it over and breaking it off. Go ahead and load that into the truck with your skid steer. Next, it's time to pinch the bottom part of the pole between the teeth and the bucket and then lift it up out of the ground. Make sure you are carefully watching the driveway if the pole butts up right next to it. You don't want any pressure at all in the driveway or you could bust a chunk out of the driveway. That's very expensive to fix. As a general rule, when pulling the pole out of the hole, do so with the skid steer parallel to the driveway. Don't be behind it or in front of it. Parallel is where you want to be. When quoting a removal that includes the concrete ball, you're going to charge the volume rate plus an equipment rate for the skid steer. Find out what the rental rate for a half day or a day is, what the taxes are, and what the delivery or pickup fee is unless you can deliver it and pick it up on your own. As a general rule, you'll mark up the rental rate by about $50 or so depending on the time it takes to coordinate everything. One thing you might be thinking is why can I not just use a sledgehammer or just rent a jackhammer? Both of these methods will work, but you're going to work long and you're going to work hard by doing it. For just a little bit more money, you can do the job quickly and professionally without wearing yourself out. We've done removal of these basketball goals using all three methods. By far and away, the easiest thing to do is the skid steer. Want to learn more about how this series can make you more money and improve your life? All you got to do is click.